Now today we have something we need to, you, listen, you need to listen carefully. If you've ever lost anything, if you've ever had anything that got away from you, if you had something that you wish you could get back, today is the day. You need to hear about it today. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray and we're going to get right into the word. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you thanks and praise. We trust you, Father, that there is a wonderful word waiting for us. It's a beautiful word, Father, that you have laid out. And I just give you praise, Father, for the miracle in the word and the signs and wonders that follow. I just trust you, Father, for this word. I thank you, Lord, that you use me, my mind and my will, my emotion, every part, that it be all of you and none of me. And I give you praise, Lord, for a supernatural word today to our spirit. And that, Lord, we do see how to receive back all that was lost. And I give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Open your Bibles this morning to 1 Samuel 30 and verse 8. 1 Samuel. Now, if you've not read this before, you need to see it in your Bible. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 8, I have up here in the Amplified on the screen, and it's, it's not much different than any other translation, but just a couple of words. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? And shall I overtake them? And the Lord answered him, Pursue. For you shall surely overtake, and without fail, recover it all. Recover it all. Now David was coming upon his town of Ziglag, and they got there in the town, they could see it in the distance as they were approaching the town, it was on fire. Everything was being burned. They were out doing their normal uh, kingly duties. He was taking down troops all over the place, but when he got back to Ziglag, it had been ravished. It had been destroyed. They burned it up with fire. They stole all the women. They stole all the children. They gathered up the, the sheep and all the, all the different cattle. And they took them all away. And when they got there, they realized the Malachites had come into town and taken their entire city. And they began to mourn and regret. And they were pouring out great regret. And they cried and they could weep no more. And they said, even among the troops, they begin to talk among themselves and say, you think we ought to kill David for this great problem that he caused us? Let's go kill David. So they gathered together to do that. And somebody came and actually told David about it because he wrote it down. And so when he heard that, he went to the Lord. He went and said, I've got to have an ephod. I'm going to go pray. So bring the priestly ephod. I'm going to call on the Lord. I'm calling for the fullness of the presence of God to talk to me. And he had to encourage himself. The Bible said he encouraged himself in the Lord. You know, this is where we miss it a lot of times. We're doing okay, except we need some encouragement. Yeah. Come on, we need some encouragement. Anybody ever been through something? Yeah. You know, like today. So if you've been through anything, if you've been through anything, you need some encouragement because it's not always easy to keep going. It's not always easy to keep fighting. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. And he went to the Lord and he said, what should I do? I'm calling on you, Lord. What should I do? Should I pursue? Should I overtake? And the Lord said, go ahead and pursue. And overtake them. And without fail, recover it all. <laughs> Now, you've got to understand, this is a good example to us that we cannot, we cannot count on others to encourage us. We've got to encourage ourselves in the Lord. We've got to dig down deep when it seems like things are going sideways, and you've got to encourage yourself. You've got to smile in the mirror and say, it's going to be all right. Everything's going to be all right. The Lord's on my side. I can do this. This is not too big for God. And it's imperative that when you get off track, which many do daily, and when we get off track, we need to go before the Lord. I think this is a good example. We need to go before the Lord and ask for guidance. Amen. Ask for guidance. And when God responds to our request, He said, this is what I want you to do. Take these steps to recover. Take these steps. And it all starts when you make up your mind you're going to fight. 
when you're going to fight the good fight of faith. When you make up your mind you're going to fight, it's too easy to quit. It's too easy to give up. You've got to make up your mind you're going to fight. Like it says in 2 Corinthians, you get to chapter 4 and verse 16. It says it like this. It says, therefore, do not lose heart. That's a big thing right there. You've got to encourage yourself. Don't you dare lose heart. Don't you quit. Don't you faint. Don't you give up. Don't you dare lose heart. Though the outward man is wasting away, we all know that. Anybody get up this morning and make noises? I'm, I'm just saying. <laughs> I have a friend that said, I remember when you used to get up and not make noises. Those were the good days. <laughs> but it says, your outward body's wasting away, but the inward man is renewing day by day. Praise God, is renewing day by day. I got a friend, used to go up to his house quite a lot. He lives up on the east side, way up there. And I'd go up and he'd invite me into his house and sit down in the kitchen. And over in the corner was a couple of chairs. And I never asked him about that the first four or five times I went there. And finally I said, why do you have a couple of chairs sitting in the corner? I mean, they're old, they're ragged, they're beat up. What's up? I, wanna, I really want to know. I mean, any guest would come into your house and see these, beat all up, these chairs all beat up sitting in the corner. What's up with that? He said, well, tell you the truth, these are my grandparents' chairs. It's all I have left from my grandparents'. Those chairs are tattered and torn from over 80 years of use. They're from the 1940 set that they bought new. I got two of the chairs left. Each of the boys got two of the chairs from their dining room set. And that's all we got a grandma and grandpa right there. I said, well, that's nice. But how come you don't use them? He said, did you look at those? They're worn out. Those chairs don't have any. They're scratched and torn. The leather's ripped and frayed. It's got cracks all in it. And those things on the back there, those used to be flowers where that stuff is just a spot in the back. That used to be painted flowers, hand painted. It was a wonderful set. And a few weeks went by. I kept seeing the same thing. A few weeks went by and I'd ask him about it again because I said, you know, have you ever thought about refinishing that? And nothing. And finally, one day those chairs were gone. I said, what happened to the chairs? He said, well, I took them to a guy to check out the possibilities of getting them refinished. I said, really? He said, yeah. So I took them to this man to see what, because they have such a sentimental value, I didn't just want to get rid of them. It's all I got left from my grandparents. It's all that, they bring a lot of memories to me. I used to, used to think about that when they were passed down to my parents and then passed down to me and, and that's all I got left. And we took them to a local refinisher for an assessment of what he could do to refinish those chairs. And later that morning he got a phone call and said, good news, we can refinish those chairs to good as new. Oh, his heart was excited. He said, how long will it take? And they told him, it's going to take about five days. And he said, the next time you come, you're going to see those chairs. I said, all right. And so time went by in a few days. I came back to his house the next week. We were working on a project together. And came back to his house and sure enough those two chairs were refinished. And they looked as good as new. I'm telling you they did a wonderful job. The flowers were back on on the backs of the seats. The leather was perfect once again. No scratches or indentations in any of that wood. They were solid as ever. And he said, you know, they have a lot of sentimental value, but now we can use them. <laughs> I said, good, and he pushed them up there and put them in the breakfast nook. I said, look at that. I said, this thing is amazing. And John told me, he said, we've begun to use these every day in the breakfast nook just because it's a reminder of the, how he said it, it's a reminder of the art of recovery. I said, really? He said, and they gave us a piece of paper. He said, it's a bona fide piece of paper that we can show ourselves. They are a master of restoration. I said, really? He said, look at this. I got a certificate from the master of restoration. I happen to know <laughs> I have a master of restoration. <laughs> Glory to God. 
He is an example. We can take things on earth and bring them back to new, but I'll tell you what, he's the only thing that can take a, a heart and bring it back. He can recover goods that you never even thought you'd ever get back. He's a master of recovery. Now, there's three lessons that we got to learn here from David. Number one, he says, I want you to pursue. Anybody know what pursue means? Yeah, you got to chase after, you got to seek, you got to you got to you got to get after the thing. You got to get after the thing. He said I want you to pursue, but then he said I want you to overcome. What's overcome? What's overcome mean? He said I want you to overcome. That means you got to catch up with, but then you got to go beyond. You got to overtake the thing to which has already tried to escape you. You got to overcome that. And then he said, "I want you to recover." Now today, we got to take a few minutes and discover what are the steps to recover. Amen. What are the steps to recover? Amen. And to start this in the steps of recover, we got to look at Joshua in chapter 10 and verses 14 through 25. I know that may be a lot of verses for somebody, but listen to me, this is all important. Amen. And this is Joshua chapter 10, we're going to start in verse 14. And there has been no day like that before it or after it that the Lord heeded the voice of a man. For the Lord fought for Israel. It says in verse 15, Then Joshua returned and all of Israel with him to the camp at Gilgal. Now very similar, some things had happened, his land was gone. But these five kings... There happens to be five kings that are against the entire nation of Israel at this time. These five kings had fled and hidden themselves in the cave at Makeda. And they got into this cave at Makeda and they told it to Joshua saying, The five kings have been found hidden in a cave at Makeda. So Joshua said, Roll large stones over the cave. Roll large stones against the mouth of the cave and set men by it to guard them. And do not stay there yourselves, but pursue your enemy. Now we know, we understand, pursue, that means seek. So chase after your enemy and attack them from the rear guard. In other words, overcome them. So it's our talking about pursue and overcome. That's always, that's part of the plan of God. Pursue and overcome. However, do not allow them to enter their cities, for the Lord God has delivered them into your hands. And it happened, verse 20, that while Joshua and the children of Israel made an end of slaying them, this is all the men that were against them, with a very great slaughter, till they had finished, only a few escaped and entered into fortified cities. Okay, it says, and those who escaped entered into fortified cities. And all the people returned to the camp to Joshua at Makeda in peace. No one moved his tongue against any of the children of Israel. How important is that? No one said a thing against Israel. And many translations says, ever again forever. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> ever again. And Joshua said... Open the mouth of the cave and bring out those five kings from the cave. And so they did and brought out the five kings from the cave. The king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, and the king of Lachish, and the king of England. Now, I think that's wonderful. And so it was that when they brought out those kings to Joshua, that Joshua called for all of the men of Israel and said to the captains of the men of war who were with them, Come near and put your feet on the neck of of the kings. Put your feet on the neck of the kings. And they drew near and they put their feet on the neck. And Joshua said unto them, Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. Be strong and be of good courage. For thus the Lord will do to your enemies against whom you fight. Whoa. Now when I saw that, I said, The whole text is really important. I may have to read the whole thing. Because I looked at that and it says these five kings were at Makeda and they got into the caves. They rolled the stone over the caves 
And here's some things we need to do today. We need to discover what are the steps to maximize the truth of recovery from the grace of God, the faith of God, into the realm of the natural. He said, I want you to recover this stuff. And if we recover it, it's... Now listen, it happened to them outwardly, but I want you to look at yourself inwardly. See it inwardly. And one more time in Joshua 10 and verse 25 it says, And Joshua said to them, Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. He said, Be strong and be of good courage. Thus the Lord will do to all of your enemies. He'll do this to all your enemies against whom you fight. And what a powerful saying. He said, I, He's going to take care of you. Now, if you're going to recover, the first thing you got to do, number one, you got to get it under control. You got to get it on. Sometimes it's just controlling your thoughts. Sometimes it's controlling yourself. But a lot of times you need to get things under control. I'm talking about some order and some structure. You got to get it under control. You got to say to yourself, look, I know I'm fighting. I know I'm in a fight. I know I'm in a fight. And I'm not going to stop this fight. It's going to happen. But there's some things that's going on. I got to get under control. I got to get some things under control. Now let me help you. Certain things go on in your life that stop you from an, staying after the fight. Got to get some stuff under control. Let me tell you like this. I got a terrible temper. But I got to get it under control. <laughs> You got to bring that thing under control. It's stopping you from getting what you're trying to do. It's keeping you from doing exactly what you intend to do. You got some stuff you got to get under control. Some of you have, some of you have an extreme high amount of insecurity. I got to get it under control. Some people, they're dealing with fear. I got to get it under control. I got to get it under control. You're not going to be able to continue your fight as long as you're fighting other things. You got to get on with your fights. You got to get that under control. You got to get it under control. These are things you must do to get things recovered. This is the steps. Then you got to get it under control. Some of you have, I, I know you don't want to admit it, but you got bad habits. And you say, how, how do he know? Everybody's got bad habits. <laughs> There's certain habits that we have that we need to stop it. You got to get it under control. If you don't get it under control, you'll do like some people do. They have a tendency to quit when it gets tough. You better get that under control. I know some good people, good people, they're willing to do whatever until it gets tough. And then they're bye-bye, can't see anymore. Because they're not willing to get it under control. You got to get it under control. Now, I've got some things that I need to get under control myself, but you may not be able to see it. I've got a stone roll over it right now. <laughs> see, I've got some stuff under control. So do you. You need to get that stuff under control. Quit letting it affect you. Put it under control. Amen? That's the first step. Because these five kings, these five authorities, these five different rulers, these five things were fighting against him at the same time, and he made a decision, we must get it under control. So he, those kings were in the cave and he put the stone over the thing. And they said to Joshua, the kings are in the cave. And Joshua said, I can't deal with them right now. I got enough other stuff going on. Put the stone in front of the cave. I'll deal with that later. Put the stone over the cave. Just roll a stone over it and hold them there on ice. And I'll get back to it later. I'll get back with it for now. Get it under control. Amen. In Proverbs 25 and verse 28, it says it like this. He that will not rule over his own spirit, he's like a city that's broken down without walls. If you can't rule your own spirit, in other words, you got some stuff to get under control. Anybody ever have your spirit, not your not your Holy Spirit in you, but your spirit man gets so excited about so many things going on at the same time. I'm getting this attack, I've got that attack, and this thing's going on, that thing's going on. And sometimes you have so many things hitting you, you don't know what to do. So you vegetate. You go into a zone where you can't handle anything anymore. And the Lord said, you better get that under control. Because if you don't put it under control, the devil's whipping you with just the sheer sense of sending you enough obstacles that you won't continue the fight. 
Amen. So you got to get that under control. Now, if you won't do that, if, if you won't do that, you will never get on with the fight. But if you can control yourself, then you're not subject to the enemy's attack and taking control of you. Amen. Amen. So you've got to have a full sense of control. You've got to be able to recognize there are some things that come up against you you can't handle right now. I've got some people say, well, I think we ought to just go in and handle it. You know, I'm not like that. I like to ponder on stuff and think about things and make sure I got God's plan on it. I want to talk to him about it. And if you are that way, then you better put it in a place where it's not controlling you. I take a piece of paper and write down all the things I got to do. Sometimes there's page after page after page just because these are all the things I got to do. If I just left them in my mind, I wouldn't be able to keep on with the fight because I got all this stuff taking up my mind power. But I put them on a piece of paper and I put scriptures beside it knowing that this is a scripture that will overcome this thing. It will not have me. I'm going to resist it. God wants you to get it under control so that you can finish going on with the fight you're in now. Amen. Some people need to get the outside stuff under control so you can bring your house in order. If you don't get all that outside stuff under control... You won't be able to get your household under control. Amen. Now, I've talked about control. I want to get to number two. It's conquest. On the recovery road, if you're going to go down that road to recovery, you've got to learn to have a conquest. A conquest. What does that mean? That means to achieve something. A victory in a certain area. To gain back something. To take hold of. I'm going to say it like this. If I'm dealing with something, I say I'm going to get back with you shortly. But for right now, i got to lay hold on the opportunity that faces me right here. i got to take hold of it right now. i got to take hold. In Philippians 3 and verse 12, it says it like this. Philippians 3, 12. It's not that I already attained or that I've already been perfected, but I press on. You know, you got to stop thinking about all that stuff behind you. You know what's bothering most people? I should be further along than I am now. I should be a whole lot further along. Man, I've, I've gone through obstacle after obstacle. I'm going to name off all my obstacles. Let me go through my obstacles. I went through this and I went through this and I went through this. And, got, and Paul's right in here. He says to the Philippians, you got to quit it. Quit looking at the things behind you and press on towards the mark of the call of, in high, a high call in Christ Jesus. That you may lay hold of that which is in Christ Jesus, that he also laid hold of me. Lay hold of it. you got to get on with what you need to get on with. Amen. So he says, get on with this thing. If you really want to press on with, God, with God's word, then you got to maximize where you are and quit dealing with where you've been. Amen. Come on, some people relive where they've been daily. I did this and I did that. I had this and that thing happened to me and that thing happened to me. I hear people's stories all the time. They're talking about stuff that happened in 1951. And they won't even get on with their life because that's still... You should see how I was raised. I can tell how you were raised. You tell me about it daily. <laughs> Amen. You need to hear what God says. If you don't lose... The thoughts about where you are, you can't get on with the fight. The fight is about now, not where you were. You got to get on with the fight for now. The fight is for now. Amen. And if you can, listen, if you can't kill it and you can't get rid of it right now, then roll a stone over it. Get the stone over it and quit thinking about it. Quit pondering on the thing that's tried to take you down because the more you think on it, the more you end up doing it. You think, well, I'm not going to do it. And the more you think about it, the more you'll do it. It's just a natural thing. You got to get it under control so that you can keep on with your conquest. Got to get it under control. Conquest. Conquest is just something to go after. Conquest is just something to go after. If you understood conquest, it would get you out of bed in the morning. There's some people, they're just sleeping in because they have nothing they have to do today. Nothing real exciting to get them going. I've heard about people say, oh yeah, I slept till 10 o'clock. Mr. Rick said, that's a 10 o'clock that you can sleep to? 
What is that about? Somebody going to keep sleeping in that because they don't have a conquest to go after. You got to be the kind of person, you got to be, it's hard to destroy a person that has a conquest. Because you'll fight knowing you got something to live for. You got to get after the thing you got to get after. You got to recover what you got to recover. If you knew that was your conquest, you'd be anxious to get on with the day instead of dreading it. Amen. That's part of the conquest. That's what God says. You need a conquest, something that's bigger than you, something that you've got to achieve, something that you've got to obtain. This conquest got to demand something out of you, and you've got to lay hold on that thing. A conquest, a conquest. It's not about wallowing around in your history. A conquest means that you're going to quit agonizing over it. You're going to quit thinking how wrong it is. You're going to quit dreading it. You're going to just capture those thoughts and you're going to get on with it. Now that takes a lot of work. That takes a lot of work. But you must have a conquest. Let me give you an example. If you've ever read Matthew 6 and verse 11... Matthew 6 and verse 11, it says, Give us this day our daily bread. How many know that Lord's Prayer? Come on. Give us this day our daily bread. And we all quote it like, Give us this day our daily bread. Like it's no big deal. This is reminiscent of the children of Israel. If you read your commentations on any of this, you'll read this was in the Lord's Prayer, was a, was a reminiscent time of the children of Israel when they called down manna from heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. It was just a matter of a mouth. Yet one thing about the daily bread you need to understand. The daily bread did not fall in their tent. Where did it fall? It fell within their reach, but it didn't fall in their tent. So they had to get something to get up for. They had to have something to get on for. They had to have something to go get. They went out to get it, and they could only gather what was going to eat that day. Because if they got too much, it would be rotten by the next day. What's my daily bread? What I can deal with today. You better get this. This is your conquest. The conquest is the thing that's within my reach to take care of today. Amen. This is how God says it. And we got to thank God. We got to thank God. He's given us some stuff. A conquest. A conquest. A thing that makes you reach. It's what gets you up in the morning. It's the thing that motivates you. It turns you. I've heard young people say, I'm just not too motivated today. Really? Well, the beatings will continue until morale improves. <laughs> well, that's what my mother used to say. But, but it, it's, it's not a good thing just to try to beat somebody into doing what they're supposed to do. You've got to stir something up inside of them. They've got something to reach for. Kids that have something to reach for are up and at it. If they don't have anything to reach for, they can't go. Adults are the same way. If you don't have something you've got to do, you know if, if a cruise line was leaving at 6.15, you'd get up at 3 o'clock and get ready and get down there because somebody gave you the cruise trip for two months. And they gave you all the money and $10,000 to spend while you was there. You could get yourself up at 4 in the morning. You'd be on down there and just standing in line. Amen. So this is real important. You've got to thank God for your conquest. You've got something to reach for. You've got something to reach. This is part of the recovery. If you know that's yours, you'll reach for it. If you know it's yours, you'll reach for it. If you don't think it's yours, you quit reaching for it. Amen. Some people have quit reaching for their healing. The devil stole it. And you have been called by God to recoup it. It's yours. It's already yours. It was not the devil's. It's yours. Amen. And he said, it's yours. I want you to have it, so reach for it. Some people get tensed and stressed and uneasy. And the reason they do, I'm going to tell you the truth, they don't have anything to reach for. You get tensed when you think about what's wrong now. I don't have anything else to go for. And so you'll fight with somebody that's closest by, usually someone you love. Because you don't have anything else to reach for. Amen. God says, I want you to get to reaching for this. Now, I've talked about conquest, but conquest is no good. And if you're talking about the steps, number one, you got control. Number two, you got conquest. But conquest is no good 
unless you actually come to a place of confronting. What do you mean confronting? You know them five kings I put in that cave and I rolled a stone over it? If you don't confront it, they're not going away. You can't do that the first day. You may not do that the second day. You got to realize I got stuff I need to control. I realize I got to have stuff I need to comp conquer, co go after. I got to take care of. But number three, you got to have something you confront. You got to confront it. If you're winning out here, but you never go back and confront what's in there, are you really winning at all? Maybe not. Because if you don't take care of the thing that's causing you the greatest problem, they're going to come back and get you again. See, there's a lot of people that want to get rid of issues in their life, but they won't actually confront the very issue that's in themselves. Because it's in their life and they've been dealing with it since they've been a child. And they won't really confront the thing and stop it. And so they keep having the same problem. In the Bible, it says this in Titus, in verse, uh, chapter 2 and verse 15. It says, declare these things. Exhort and rebuke with authority. Let no one discard you. No one dis disregard you. Anybody ever felt disregarded? We say it like this disrespected the devil's doing that to people all the time just disking them all the time disrespecting them and making fun of their life you got to get this thing up under control now let me give you an example that's real life this is real true to life you ready for this real true to life example if I just paint the ceiling where the spot showed up <laughs> it's real true to life had a spot come on my ceiling. If you just paint the ceiling where the spot showed up, you're going to have to keep painting that spot because the thing you wouldn't stop is going to leak through. And you've got to paint it and paint it and paint it and paint it because you won't go up there and confront it. You won't confront what caused the leak and you won't confront the stain itself. And in our lives, we got the thing that we need to stop in our life. And we got to confront the thing that causes the stain itself. Amen. So if we've got these things going on in our life, if we got it, then we don't, if we don't take care of it, you're going to keep painting it over and over again and again and again and again. Trying to hide the thing that you won't confront. And it happens in almost everybody's life. You won't confront the thing. You can't recover the thing because you won't confront the thing that caused the problem to begin with. Amen. Oh, the people that have made the life's decision not to confront something in their life. Bad decision. I need a conquest, yes. But I need to return to the source of the problem. I need to go back and confront the thing that started it to begin with. If I don't confront the thing, it's going to show up again and again. Look, I, I can even kill off the men that are, are causing me a problem. I can kill off those men. But if I don't kill off the source, they're going to send those men again. And maybe not the ones I killed, but some other ones. They're going to come against me again. In that same manner. If I just paint over the stain with regular paint, and don't cover that stain with some kind of uh, uh, kills or some way to get rid of that stain and stop the stain from ever starting up again. If I don't go up there and confront the very issue that's in the ceiling that caused the stain to begin with, I'm going to have another stain. Maybe the whole ceiling cave in. Sure. Amen. Some people, they demand excellence of their children. I'm going a whole different direction for a second. Some people demand excellence their children. And they beat their child that won't do it right. They demand excellence of their children. But if you don't take care of the atmosphere that caused the problem to begin with, you're going to keep beating the child in Fentium. Because there's a problem somewhere in the house, 
Some were with their friends, some were at the school, some were on their internet. Somewhere there's a problem that's allowing this thing to get in the house. There's strife usually somewhere. Strife's a killer. Strife will leak in from anywhere. And when the strife comes in, you need to confront that thing because you won't confront it. It's going to show up again. And it's going to show up again. Many punish the child, but the child is just a reflection of what's going on in the house. Amen. And everybody said amen. <laughs> what you're trying to beat out of the child is just a sign to say to you, look, you got something in the house going on and you need to confront it. Now, I'm not talking about just confront or confrontational as if it's an adversarial thing. I'm talking about that you need to confront it. You need to confront it. In other words, you need to quit denying that the issue exists. And you need to go in front of that thing and stop it. There's so, how many would admit today you got something in your life you need to confront? Amen. Hey, listen, everybody ought to check themselves because every day I find things in my life that I need to confront. Yes. You might say, well, I don't live that kind of a life. Oh, listen, contraire. <laughs> contraire. The devil's out to kill, steal, and destroy. He's out to push things on your life. I'm the pastor. And I got about mm, five of those things sitting in a cave somewhere. Are you with me? And they're after this mug. They're trying to knock me out and take me down. So we can't just go around and say, well, I don't have any problems. Yeah, we do. We need to confront some of this stuff. Amen. The problem is we're not being honest with ourselves. We've got to confront this stuff, bring it to light, say, I'm not going to let this thing take me down anymore. Amen. And when you make that kind of decision, you become a kind of Christian the devil hates. Because you're the one that stands up against all odds and said, no, I'm going to take the word and beat you over the head with it. Right. Amen. You become a whole different person. And you will not confront it. You will not confront the thing. You will not confront it. Let's put it this way. If you won't confront it, you can't conquer it. Amen. If you won't confront it, there's no conquering involved. There's no con you will not overtake, you will not conquer that thing if you never confront it. So number four is conquer. You gotta conquer, you gotta conquer, you gotta conquer. That means to overthrow. You gotta conquer it. That means you gotta root it out. Sometimes you don't even know what it is you need to conquer. But it's after you and you gotta keep looking until you find the thing. Oh man, that's it right there. I had a guy tell me, he said, I got a little problem. I said, what? He said, I don't think well about women. I said, what do you mean don't think well? I mean, everybody should think well about women. He said, well, I, I, I don't look at them that way. I look at them like objects. Like something, it's just for my pleasure. I said, you do have a problem. <laughs> he said, can you help me? I said, sure. Are you willing to take the advice? He said, you know, some days I'm just sitting there in the office and a thought comes. He said, the thought comes. I start thinking about women. I start thinking about women. And next thing you know, I drive down to Redondo Beach and I'm, I'm ready to find some women. I don't, I'm not even thinking about my wife at home. I'm just thinking about women in bikinis or less. I said, well, let's put it this way. Do you have an internet? He said, yeah. I said, would you let me look at it? Let me see your history. You want to what? I, I want to look at the background. Where you been? What you been looking at? Well, what's that got to do with anything? Because whatever you've been looking at is looking at you. It's trying to get you to do something. It's trying to infiltrate your mind. It's trying to change your thoughts so that your thoughts take control of you. You won't take control of it. And it's got a hold of you. It's laid hold on you. And you have never tried to conquer it. Oh, I've tried to conquer it. No, you don't because you won't confront it. Will you allow me to put some kind of security on your internet so you can't get these things on there anymore? Well, no. Really, what you're saying is you won't confront it because that's your friend. The moment you think anything going on, you got to revert back to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been doing that all my life. He said, there you go. Yeah. That's why you got problems. That's why you're on your fifth wife. Mm -hmm. Amen. 
Now I'm talking about you need to conquer it. Conquer it. Joshua 10 and verse 22, it says it like this. Joshua 10 and 22, it says, Joshua said, open the mouth of the cave and bring out those five kings. He told him, open the mouth of the cave, bring out those five kings. He said, get them out here. Bring, open, the, open the mouth, that's what he said. Bring out those five kings. And when they did, he said, now it's time to do something. It's time to conquer it. So they brought out the five kings, and it says in about verse 24, it says, now he told the captains, okay, put your foot on their neck. You know, when you put your foot on their neck and you can feel the heart throb through your boot, you can feel that coming up on your boot, you got every bit of control in your foot. The Bible says, Satan, under our feet. <laughs> Every bit of control under your foot. Right. You put that thing on his neck and you say, you say what? You're going to do what? <laughs> you put your foot on his neck. Amen. You put your, you got complete control at this point. Do you see that? You put, there's nothing like that feeling. The feeling that you have conquered the enemy. There's a conquest going on. The conquering is there. You put your foot on the enemy's neck. The feeling of winning. There's nothing like it in the world. And once you taste this. That you're about to be a conqueror. You won't want to do anything else. You want to be a conqueror again and again and again. Because once you win. Winning is important. You want to put your foot on his neck. Listen to me. There's some people here. I just got a word of the Lord. He said this. There's some people here that have been having Terrible stuff happen in their life. But don't be concerned. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. He said in the same manner these things have tried to come against you. I'll come against them. Amen. 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 <coughs> now personally if you listen. Personally. I have a little. Uh, I'm, I'm telling off of myself here. I have a tendency to get hooked on the fight. I don't mind a battle. And I've got family members that hate confrontation. Not me. I don't know what it is. I guess I was in debate and something about being in debate it does it to you. I, I, I don't mind a confrontation because I can beat them. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm always thinking I'm going to win this one. And so uh, I, I like the battle. I don't know what it is, but I like the battle that's involved. And I have a tendency to get hooked on the fight. And I just go from one fight to the next fight. to the. I have to watch myself because if I don't be careful, I do it to my wife. I'm ready to, you say what? You did what? <laughs> and I, oh wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. And she said, I'm not the enemy, I'm not the enemy. I go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's not the enemy right there. That's my wife right there. She loved me. See, I'm, 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 I got to watch that. Because I go from one fight to the next fight. You know, God, in the midst of his battle and making the world and everything that's in it, he stopped every day. And, and the Bible was written, the first five books of the Bible was written by Moses. And he says, and behold, it was good. Now the question is this, who said it was good? It was God talking. That's why Moses wrote it down. So when something's good, God goes, ooh, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> and the next day come along and goes, ooh, that's good right there. That, I don't care what you say, that's good right there. And the third day come along, ooh, that one's good right there. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. If you're really going to learn to recover, you've got to come to a point where you begin to celebrate. Yeah. Celebration. Some people don't like celebration, but there's nothing like this. You cannot let the enemy deny you celebration. Celebration. Some of you got to throw your, you ready for this? You got to throw your own party. Yeah. I mean, even God threw his own party saying, it's good right there, that's good right there. And he throws his own party. The Bible says that sometimes you need to celebrate for yourself. If you catch the essence of this, you need to celebrate. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 57 says like this, But thanks be unto God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
He gives us the victory. He gives us the victory. He gives us the victory. What's the word victory? That's a conqueror. Victory. You win. You're the conqueror. You're the conqueror. Jesus gives us the victory. You're the winner. You're the winner. Don't let other people be happier about your success than you are. Now, some of us get into a thing where we say, well, I don't want to be prideful. You know, false pride anyway. You just, I don't want to be, I don't want to just toot my own horn. Go ahead, toot your horn. Ain't nobody else going to toot it. Come on. You got to be, you got to let yourself be the winner. Don't let them be happier for you than you are yourself. You need to bake yourself a cake. I mean, I mean a good old cake with sugar in it. I mean, you need to put some frosting on it and get a candle or two on there. You ought to light yourself a candle, get yourself a cake. You ought to say to yourself, things are good. They are good. And behold, it was good. You ought to say it was good right there. You ought to take yourself out to dinner. Because when you're celebrating, you do those kinds of things. You take yourself to dinner. Now, Psalms 118 and verse 24, it says, This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. You need to rejoice for heaven's sake. Tell your neighbor, I'm a conqueror. Come on, tell your neighbor, I'm a conqueror. When you're a conqueror, you ought to act like it. You ought to act like it. You ought to celebrate that thing. I had to fight to get where I am. Come on, I had to fight to get my degree. I had to fight to hold on to my job. I had to fight to get, continue to be here today. That's right. I had to fight. I had to fight. I had to fight to raise this child. You don't know what I went through, but I had to fight. Now, I'm going to celebrate with or without you. Amen. Amen. I made my decision this year. Mm-hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make me some cakes. Amen. Praise God. Listen, I confess my tendency is to do the work in hopes that somebody else will throw me the party. (laughs) Isn't that like you? But what I have found out is this makes you dependent upon the appreciation of the other other person, even though this is Pastor Appreciation Day. (laughs) You put yourself under subjection to the appreciation of the other person before you set yourself up with a party. And here's what I'm going to say to you. If you do that, then you'll just go from battle to battle with no celebration. Remember when you got out of high school? You got out of high school? Did you go to a party? You got out of college? Did you have a party? Huh. But you go through the rest of your life, you may have a birthday party, you may have a Christmas party, you may have a Thanksgiving party, or a Valentine's party, but it's got to have some significance that everybody else is going through before you'll have a party. I'm telling you, you need some kind of party that's not just that. You got to make a commitment, like I did, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make myself some cakes this year. Listen. I'm going to make myself some cakes and get myself some candles and tell myself it's all right. It's all good. Amen. I'm talking about some crazy parties. I'm talking about I just paid off the car party. Come on. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The car's paid off. Glory to God. I'm talking about some crazy parties. I'm talking about, look, I just bought me a new suit party. Hallelujah. Some people say, well, that's a crazy part. Yes, it is. It's time to lift up God for whatever he's done in your life. If you've recovered from something and you got yourself something new, you ought to be thankful for it. I went through a whole year without cancer party. Some people say, well, I just went through a year. Yeah, well, praise God. Hallelujah. That's a victory, don't you see? You made a conqueror. You better celebrate what you've got. Otherwise, you might as well just wallow around in the disease you're stuck in because you won't party about it when you get well. Amen. You might as well throw yourself a party. In John 10, 10, I quoted that a minute ago, but it says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But he said, I have come that they might have life and life more abundantly. You ought to enjoy that abundant life. Hallelujah. A couple of weeks ago, a guy called me. He said, I know you're not my pastor, but I can't talk to my pastor. You know, when people preface their conversation like that, you're about to get a load of something. I said, so what's up? He said, I'm going through something. 
He only talks to me when he's going through something. I'm going through something. Yeah. He said things are going wrong and I'm, I'm kind of on the brink of depression. Serious depression. I'm, I'm thinking about getting some kind of pills to help me get through this. I'm going through depression. And I told him, as long as you live on this earth, I said, the Bible says there's always going to be trouble and tribulations. There's always going to be problems. You're not going to have a time. You're not going to go through something. You're always going to go through something. Now listen to me. I said there's three things. You're a good man. You're doing a good job. I said listen to me. You're fighting a good fight. You're doing a good job. You're a good man. And he started crying. I said oh, Lord all, all I did was say what you said to say. <laughs> And, and the man's on the phone crying. I can't even get his attention. He crying. And, and through his tears he said, <laughs> Nobody ever said that to me before. I said, well listen to me, buddy. You better start saying, if nobody else ever says it to you again, you better start saying it to yourself. I'm a good man. I fought a good fight. I'm doing a, I'm doing a good job. Because if you won't celebrate yourself and no, you're waiting on somebody else to celebrate you. You got to celebrate that for yourself. Because nobody else knows what it costs you to be where you are. That's right. They don't know. And so we've gone through four. If we've gone through four, the control, we've gone through the conquest, we've gone through confronting, and we've gone through conquering. We've gone through conquering. But number five, number five, you're going to recover if you're a champion. A champion. Now some people don't, they don't recognize there's a difference between conqueror and champion. There's a vast difference. Conquering, winning, you might do that one time. You're still called a conqueror. You're identified by the thing which you conquered. You did it one time. You're a conqueror. You did it one time. You're a winner. You might have done it one time. But a champion, they're always a winner. <laughs> They have a habit of winning. They say, it's their normal. It's what they normally do. They got a new norm. They do it all the time. They're always a winner. They're a winner. They're a winner. They're a winner. They're always a winner. And it's not just a one-time conquering. It's not just a one-time winning. They're a winner. They're a winner. They continue to conquer. They're a champion. Yes. Say it out of your mouth. I'm a champion. God wants you to be a champion. Now listen to me. According to the scriptures in Roman 8, look at verse 37. Romans 8 and verse 37. It said, yet in all these things, you are more than a conqueror. More than a conqueror. And they, and he said, more than a conqueror through him that loved you. He loved us. You're more than a conqueror. Listen, if you're going to be more than a conqueror, it's called a champion. Because that means, listen, I used to think more than a conqueror, you're still just a conqueror, but, but you, you give the money to your wife and she's more than a conqueror. <laughs> and I always thought, well, that's, that's the way you're supposed to look at it. Until the Lord described to me this one in this particular study right here, he said, no, that's not it. A conqueror can even have just one winning. He's still a conqueror. But more than a conqueror, he's in the habit of winning all the time. He wins and he wins and he wins and he wins because he's the champion. Yes. I am the champion. Yes. And when you go around the champion, the devil hates to mess with the champion. He can deal with a conqueror because he can always get them to forget that they conquered. But you can't mess with a champion because I'm going to take you down too. Yes. I'll take everybody else down. I'm going to take you down too. Amen. When you're a champion, when you're a champion, when you're a champion, it's more than a conqueror. They're not the same thing. They're not the same thing. Because a champion, you ready for this? Is a master at restoration. He's hooked up with him that knows how to restore. And he's just the same, because he can do the same thing, God said, the same thing I do, you do, and even more. Because I go to sit beside my father. And he said, I'm a master restorer, and so are you. Amen. Amen. In Joel 2, it gets to verse 25 and says it like this. It says, and I will restore. I'm getting back to you. I'm bringing this stuff back to you. The years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. I'm getting it all back. 
how about you? Amen. 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 I'm bringing this all back to you. I'm bringing this all back to you. I've been called by God. I'm destined to be a champion and so are you. I'm not, and Joshua said this, I'm not here just, just to possess this land. I'm not here just to stand on this land. I stand here to own it. I'm a champion. This is mine. I have it now. I received this land. It's mine. The difference between a conqueror and a champion is how you define yourself. A conqueror defines himself by the one fight that he fought. But a champion defines himself by the winner that he is. Ooh, glory. John 24 said, call out to his kings, put your foot on their neck. But you get to Joshua 10 and verse 26. And it says it like this. And after Joshua struck them down and killed them. Now wait a minute. He killed them. How come did he kill them? Because it's what conquerors do. He killed them. Then he did something else. He killed them. And the enemy must be killed. <clears throat> then according to this scripture, and he hanged them on five trees. Now wait a minute. Weren't they already dead? Yeah, yeah he killed them. Isn't this a case of gross overkill? <laughs> Uh, pardon the pun. When he put them on the tree, weren't they already dead? Yes. And I told the Lord, I said, why in the world would he hang them on a tree after they're already dead? He said, because that's what champions do. It's called a trophy. Oh. He said, do you remember when you were in college? Yeah. He said, you remember that groundskeeper you talked with? Yeah, I saw him about every month. Remember you'd go up and talk to him and, and, and kind of ask him about how life is and what you're supposed to do and he'd always tell you stuff. And all the time he would tell you all the fields that were around your college were big grassy fields, big grassy knolls all around the college because the college was in the, little middle, in the middle of a town where nothing else was. There was nothing around this college, nothing around this college, but these little coyotes would come up on the grounds in the college and the groundskeeper would catch them in a trap and he'd kill them. And he'd hang them on the outskirts of the college grounds and they'd always be hanging there. We'd always ask him, why'd you put those stupid dead coyotes, hang them up and hang them around the whole campus? He said, well, son, I'll be quite honest with you. You have to put up them dead coyotes to let the other coyotes know that smell that they can smell that's what's going to happen to them if they step on this ground. And he said, I kill them and then I hang them. And the reason I do is so all the other coyotes realize we're going to die ourselves if we get near him. We need to, as a spirit of God, we need to do just like Joshua did. He hung those kings and told everybody around him, I'm going to tell you something. Anybody else? You mess with, you try me, this is what's going to happen to you. Yeah. You, tr you try me, this is what's going to happen to you. I think we ought to remind the enemy, if you try me, this is what's going to happen to you. I'm going to kill you and string you up for everybody to see. Because yeah. I'm a champion. I need me some trophies. Yeah. You're going to be my trophy in just a minute. I'm going to hang you up for everybody to see. I got a lot of trophies. Because champions got a lot of trophies. Yeah. And so they got a lot of dead bodies hanging around. Are you with me? <laughs> Amen. I believe this is what God wants us to do. Is to get things under control. To get us more than a conqueror. And to become a champion because this is what God wants us to do. Amen.
Now listen to me. If you've got the spirit of a champion today, I think you ought to take a minute and give God some praise. Come on, just give him some praise. Hallelujah, Father. We glory to you, God. We glory in your name, Lord God. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, we approach your throne today. Lord, we're so thankful that you have given us a word from heaven. I pray, Father God, that we would grab a hold of this word and make it exciting in our life, that there be nothing that would stop us from fulfilling the very call of God that you placed in us. We come against all the devil's strategies and even today, Father, we recover. We put ourselves to go after the very things that have been stolen. We're going to stand up and control it. We're going to and stay on our conquest. We're going to come against that thing by confronting the very thing, the issues in our life. And Father, we're going to conquer those things and stand strong as a champion. Because we'll have victory after victory after victory. And I give, a, I give you praise, Lord God, for the very thing you've given us today that is supernatural in our lives. And today, the Lord said, if there's some people here and you say, from this point, I've made a decision. I, too, will walk as a champion. And if that's you, raise your hand and tell the Lord, yes, Lord, I walk as a champion. I walk as a champion. I walk as a champion. This is the path you have for me, not just a one-time victor, but I'm more than a conqueror. I can do all things through Christ that strengthen me. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The Lord's the strength of my life. The peace of God that passes understanding quickens my heart and my mind through Christ Jesus. The things that are good and lovely, good report and virtue and praise, I think on these things. I let no corrupt communication come out of my mouth, but that which is edifying and brings grace to the hearer. I grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby I'm sealed into the day of redemption. I thank you, my God, that I have become a champion unto you. I'm a champion on this earth. And I give you praise, Lord God. I give you praise. I give you praise. Glory to God. Now, if you've dealt with anything, I'm talking specific things this morning. The Lord said, look, if you've dealt with something... You've dealt with the lower back, you've dealt with your hips or your legs, lower back, hips or legs. Lower back, hips or legs. And now you know if it's your lower back, you know if it's been in your hips, you know if it's been in your legs. If it's been in your knees, it's still in your legs. If it's been in your hips, it's been in your legs. If it's been in your lower back, it's been in your, it's in your back. You need to honor God by letting him know... Father God, I know this particular thing will not stand in my life. Raise your hand. Raise your hand unto the Lord and tell him, Father God, this thing will not stand in my life. I refuse to let this stand. Thou will confront the very thing. I say unto you, back, you are healed. Hips, you are healed. By his stripes, I am healed. Lower back, knees, hips, I command you to come in line right now in the name of Jesus. No weapon that's been formed against me me will prosper. Every tongue that's tried to rise up against me is proven wrong. It's proven wrong. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. If you've dealt with headaches, I'm talking about headaches, earaches, eye aches, you've had any kind of aches in your head. You can't get yourself, your thoughts under control. If you've had an ache in your head where you've even had to take medication for it. If you had something happen in your head, your ears, your eyes, but in your nose, your throat. If you've had something happen in your head, raise your hand, we're going to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, all those that have dealt with head trauma, we come against that thing in the name of Jesus. We command that thing to be healed and whole and well. And the virtue of God to come upon you. Right now in the name of Jesus, I declare your body healed. I declare your body whole. I declare that you breathe right. I declare that your mind is free from all obstructions in the name of Jesus. I decree your blood flows properly. I decree your ears are healed and whole. I decree your eyes are right and see 2020 in the name of Jesus. Right now, by faith, 
And finally, I pray for those that are dealing with anything in your family, anything where you have had a difficult time with family members. I'm talking about from an odd conversation to ones that aren't doing right with God to those that have opposed you openly. If you've got any opposition with family members or you've got any family member that needs to be saved, raise your hand. Father, in the name of Jesus, for all the family members that need salvation, they need consecration, they need to be right with you. We come against any foul spirit that would try to stop them, and we confront that spirit now. Father, I pray that you give us the boldness and you give us the courage to stand strong even against adversarial things. And I give you praise and glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.